So good morning, everyone. My name is Hollis France. I'm the associate. I'm an associate professor and the chair of the political science department. And I will be your moderator for this session on global hunger. So I want to first express um, my excitement to Randy Russell, President Shu, who's not with us right now, and Provost Austin. Um, for working collaboratively to provide this opportunity, the bridge, what we do in the classroom here at the College of Charleston with the insights of those caught up in the day-to-day -day practice of making and implementing policy domestically and globally around food security. So this is indeed a treat to hear firsthand and in real time from those in the field about the drivers of global hunger, the barriers in place towards achieving food security, and what we can all do individually and collectively to eradicate global hunger. So on stage, we have the honor of two impressive stakeholders with impressive CVs in the global hunger battlefield. Uh, so, Sitting right next to me is Dan Gluckman, who is a former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, a Kansas native, and a lawyer by training. He has a well-established and recognized history in the fields of agriculture, nutrition, hunger, bipartisan politics, and public policy, following a long career in the federal government advocacy, the private sector, and non, the nonprofit areas. And then sitting over there, uh, we have Rebecca Middleton, uh, who's, who employs her strong advocacy skills as the chief advocacy engagement officer of the World Food Program USA to educate members of Congress and their staffs on the importance of U.S. government support for the U.N. food program. She brings more than 25 years of experience in policy, advocacy, and st strategy to the role. So the roadmap for um, this session will involve me posing questions uh, to Dan and Rebecca for approximately 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the audience um, for the last remaining 10 minutes uh, to fo for follow-up questions. So I know that Baron and you did a great job in terms of opening up for us, you know, in terms of the global level, um, some of the challenges and opportunities. And I think with both Dan and Rebecca, we can kind of drill down a little bit more and get perhaps in terms of some more kind of concretized uh, examples. So Rebecca, I want to kind of begin with you first. And, you know, uh, after you've um, given your insights, perhaps, Dan, you can add on to that um, any additional observations. So Rebecca, until a few years ago, the world was making progress towards eliminating hunger cutting poverty and global hunger rates in half between the years 2000 to 2015. What caused the trend to reverse with more people being hungry in 2018 than in the years before? And what do you believe is needed to get us back on the right path? Well, thank you so much for that. And first, I just want to say thank you for having me here. It's really a pleasure to be with you all and always a joy to be in Charleston, one of my very favorite cities. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that's frustrating and motivating about doing this work. So as you mentioned, I've been in Washington, D.C., doing policy and advocacy in different roles for a quarter of a century. And I joined the anti-hunger advocacy space a little bit over 10 years ago. And at the time, things were going in the right direction. There was uh, something through the United Nations that countries adopted called the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs. And one of those goals was to cut poverty and hunger in half within 10 years. And they were able to do that in large part due to progress that was made in China and India. There was other progress in the world, but that was really where the dramatic shift took place. And so 
Then the UN came back and said, well, we made such good progress. Let's see what we can do looking into the 21st century and beyond. And they created the Sustainable Development Goals. And these were incredibly ambitious, um, partly, I think, due to the success of some of the Millennium Development Goals. And one of them is zero hunger and uh, really audacious. How do we get to zero hunger? But things were going in the right direction. What happened about seven, eight years ago was that the forces impacting hunger related to conflict in particular were just overwhelming. Um, Yemen in particular, Syria, some of the other crises around the world just tipped the scales back in the direction of more people being hungry than there had been in the years before. And that sort of stayed at equilibrium for a couple of years and then COVID. And obviously everyone knows what happened with COVID shocks here and around the world, but what the impact was on hungry people is it doubled the number of people who were hungry in the world almost overnight. Um, and it wasn't because COVID stopped, it was because the food system stopped because of the trade barriers that have been mentioned earlier. You know, people stayed home, borders were closed, and it was, um, and then also folks lost, lost their livelihoods. And so they even if had, they had access to food, they no longer had the resources with which to purchase that. So on top of that, even as we're coming out of the economic shocks of COVID, the conflict has just been extraordinary. And I know we're gonna talk a little bit, ex especially on uh, the Ukraine crisis and the impact that that has had. But it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's, really, it's really tough when you are going in a direction, you're making the progress you wanna make, and then all of a sudden there's this severe U-turn. But it gives me hope because there's been a lot of focus on this in a meaningful way. Um, Unfortunately, there's been crisis after crisis, some man-made, some natural disasters, but you've had Afghanistan, you've had, East, you've had Ethiopia, you've had the Ukraine crisis, and then you've had the recent earthquake in Turkey and Syria. But the world is paying attention, and I think folks are saying, wait a minute, you know, 40 years ago, we're talking about the famine in Ethiopia, and that's when I first really became aware of the needs around the world in this space and the role that the United Nations World Food Program played in that. It's 40 years later, we didn't... We didn't have the internet, much less you know, supercomputers in our pockets like we do now. We've made so much progress in so many areas, but why are we still fighting this, fighting this battle? But there are a lot of innovative solutions and also a lot of really good people focused on this and how they can use their vocation to make a difference. So that's what gives me hope. First of all, thank you for welcoming me here. Baron, you did a terrific job, particularly telling the story, the narrative, which is so important. Thanks for welcoming me to Charleston. I'm from Wichita, Kansas. And um, the reason why I mention that is because when I left the airport, I saw this big Boeing facility there. That used to be in Wichita, Kansas, all right? <laughs> it's come here to Charleston. And yeah, anyway, I don't hold it against you. I, I may hold it against Boeing, but not against you all. So I'm, no, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and to your great city and this great university and college. I would just amplify a little bit. Rebecca does a wonderful job because her job is to try to get, in many cases, government, the government of the United States to support these programs. We're the largest donor to the World Food Program. We're the largest donor to food security around the world. We're the, we have domestically, we have the largest food security program in the world in America, the SNAP program. We feed about 50 million Americans here. So America has this long history of helping people at home and around the world, and we can do both, and we can, talk, you, we can certainly talk about that later. The other good news is for years and years when I was agriculture secretary, I used to go to these global meetings on security generally, Nobody would ever talk about food and agriculture. It was never on the agenda. They talked about national security issues or U.S.-Russia relationships or, or maybe China or other geopolitical issues. But now food security, food issues are high up on the agenda. And that's good news for the people of, of students studying because, you know, for years and years this, this wasn't a high agenda item. A uh, long time ago I was the chief lobbyist for the motion picture industry. And um, so I used to watch a lot of movies, and one movie I used to watch a lot was The Graduate. Some of you remember that movie. And in that movie, Dustin Hoffman is uh, told by his prospective father-in-law about what business he ought to go to, the secret sauce of the future, and it was plastics. Well, I don't think plastics is the secret sauce anymore. But food and food security and food supply chains and food research and food development, these are a, a heart 
of a lot of what's happening in the world today. So it's a great career opportunity, and people are now focused on it. And that's a positive in terms of globally, as Rebecca says, we're now focused on these issues. We see it in our social media. We, we hear about it. We know how it relates to geopolitical security and, and economic disparity and, and, and how it relates to poverty as well. Because poverty, in addition to climate and COVID and conflict, poverty is a huge reason why people are hungry, both at home and around the world. If you can't earn any money, if you're poor, if you go from minute to minute without knowing where your next resources are coming from, then it really, it really demonstrates the fact that how com uh, comprehensive this subject is. I just mentioned a couple of other things. COVID taught us something that we didn't think about before, how a pandemic can change the world overnight. COVID's not the last pandemic we're gonna have. There are going to be viruses, there are going to be funguses, there are going to be issues that are going to affect people, animals, and plants around the world. And they're going to spread because no longer do national borders stop this from happening. So we need as a, as a society and as a globe to deal with issues like this because we could have another COVID next year for all we know. Are we prepared to deal with it? Um, and I don't think we are now, but I think that uh, we're, we're starting to recognize that, uh, in fact, you know, we need to do this. The other positive thing I would just say before I close is the bipartisanship of these issues. Washington is in some degree of gridlock these days, and as most of the people in this room know, and it's, I'm not being excessively partisan because I'm not a terribly partisan guy, but this, these are one of the few issues that people work together on. And, and you're lucky in South Carolina, I'm a Democrat, you're lucky in South Carolina because you have one of the leaders in the globe in dealing with food security, and that's your Senator Lindsey Graham. I don't agree with Lindsey on everything, I want you to know that. But on this issue, he's a hero. And uh, so one of the jobs, because why? Because if the US government gives a lot of money to these programs, we're gonna be in large part responsible for solving the problem. And if we're giving a lot of money, then maybe we can get the rest of the world to give a lot of money. And to do that, we need advocates in the United States. And so one of the recommendations is for you to recognize how important the work like Rebecca does in ensuring the U.S. government, even these tight, during these tight fiscal and economic times we have, continue to support people who are hungry, at, both at home and around the world. We have the resources. We're a rich country. We can do it, and the political system just needs to be continued to be encouraged to do that kind of thing. Well, it's really great to hear from both of you that we have hope, at least in terms of this gaining a lot more visibility. Um, and that seems to be a really good thing for us in terms of solving some of this. So, Dan, this gives us a, a chance to kind of delve into this relationship between food security and global, the kind of global political security. So how does food security impact global geopolitical security and US national security as well? And think of them vice versa, because all of those things seem to kind of be connected. And can you trace some of the connections between famine, hunger, civil and, and political unrest globally? And I was thinking perhaps that you can give us some kind of concrete examples, both kind of historically and probably currently. Well, I, I know that, uh, that, that Rebecca and her team and Barron and others have a long list of these things, but the classic example is the Ukraine, okay. So even I, who'd been involved in agriculture for years and years, never recognized that about a third of the world's wheat supply, sunflower oil supply, came from this region of the world, and how much it impacted uh, the developing world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Now the US is a major exporter of agricultural commodities, but the leverage that Ukraine and Russia had have had in terms of uh, exports of grains uh, in Europe, but largely in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, has been demonstrably significant. And so what we saw with the Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is that basically ground to a halt almost instantaneously, and as Barron said, had an impact on food prices in the U.S. and around the world, and the availability of, of um, uh, countries, particularly in the developing world in East Africa, uh, to get their supplies on, in regular order 
and uh, at, at, at reasonably priced, and it just screwed up supply chains around the world, even here in the United States. So that's, you know, and, and you know, the Ukrainians are very self-sufficient people, so uh, they've been able to cope about as well as we can, uh, they can, and, and um, but it's really hurt the, the countries that imported that food from that region of the world. And so that's a per, perhaps a classic example um, you had the situation with the Arab Spring, which is, of course, 20 years ago, which impacted uh, the riots all over North Africa, and it was because of food shortages in Tunisia and North Africa. And there, there's another, you know, classic e example. And there's one other example I want to mention, which is the issue of health and nutrition. What we're finding is, is that uh, what uh, countries not only need is quantity of food, but as Barron mentioned, we also need to figure out the fact there's a relationship between what people eat and what diet and related diseases they get. We're seeing an overwhelming increase in cardiovascular and arthritis and uh, non-communicable diseases in the developing world that we never saw before. Diseases we had in the United States, but they didn't have in the rest of the world because in many cases their diets were you know, much different, different than ours. So that's obviously an impact when, when we have these uh, food supply chains and these crises that, that we're seeing around the world. Uh, the good news is America still produces way more food than we consume domestically. We're able to be an active participant in, in getting much of this product and resources around the world. Thanks. I want to pick up on your comment, Dan, earlier about how this is a bipartisan issue. And it's, it's actually one of the reasons why I love working on this. And this gets to the conflict piece in a second. Um, we were in an event just the other night as a send-off for the current executive director of the UN World Food Program, David Beasley, and welcoming the incoming executive director, Ambassador Cindy McCain. And in my 26 years in DC, I've never been in an event like this. There were at least two dozen members of Congress almost evenly split between Republicans and Democrats, and among those who spoke, which was, it was also pretty evenly split, um, they talked about how this is such a uniting issue, is the US commitment to addressing world hunger. Um, for a little bit of perspective, because of the Ukraine crisis last year, there was an extremely, um, I, I, I still don't believe this when I say this, but the United States government provided an additional $5 billion for global food security. The total U.S. contribution to the United Nations World Food Program last year was $7.3 billion, more than 50% of what they received. And the only way that that happens is because it comes together and, and brings everybody together on this. There are three reasons for that, why members of Congress support global hunger initiatives. One is just the humanitarian cause. This is the right thing to do to help people in need. The United States has fed people around the world with different means going back almost 200 years. This is not a new thing. It took on a new level of sophistication in 1961 with the formation of both the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, and the United Nations World Food Program. But this is a long and, and really proud history that we have. It's like mom, apple pie, and feeding people. Um, it, so that's one reason, is the humanitarian reason. The second reason is U.S. agriculture. U.S. agriculture provides food around the world, always has, has gotten much more thoughtful about how we do that so that we're not undermining local markets, which I think we'll talk about in a moment. But a lot of reasons why a lot of, particularly Midwest members of Congress support this is because there's no greater anti-hunger hero than an American farmer, and those are their constituents. The third reason, and this is a really powerful one, is the tie to national security and global security. Food security and, and stability are intimately intertwined. And we've actually, at the World Food Program USA, done some research on this. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to go on our website, which is wfpusa.org. And there's a report from five years, ago, five years ago called Winning the Peace. And this was really the first academic assessment of the literature and research out there on the nexus of conflict and hunger. We all know that in situations where there's conflict, Hunger and poverty follow. That's just a natural progression, unfortunately. But what we've seen is that sometimes food insecurity can be a precipitating factor for conflict, not on its own. Hungry people around the world are not inherently conflict inclined. But when it's combined with things like climate shocks, uh, dissatisfaction with the government on multiple levels, it can be this really volatile combination. So five years ago, Winning the Peace came out. We decided with everything that's happened in the last five years to revisit it, and we have a piece coming out next month called Dangerously Hungry. And what's fascinating is that the volume of academic research on the nexus of conflict and hunger 
in the last five years is almost twice what it was in the 20 years leading up to that first report. Now, a lot of what's in there is around climate, too. You can't talk about these things without talking about climate and increased climate shocks and the challenges that that's having. But because of that global security aspect, there are members of Congress that might not think that we've got a moral obligation, might not have agricultural interests in their district, but they do see the value of investing because if we don't spend the money to feed people now, we're going to be back there with foreign assistance or military assistance later on, which is going to cost much, much more. Just to add just a couple points. One is, to give you some context, uh, two out of every three bushels or pounds of food are consumed domestically, but one out of every three has to either be sold exported or donated. Otherwise, it would have a disastrous impact on American agriculture. So there's this huge historical reason, economic reason, why farmers and, and also the bounty of American agriculture were so efficient and productive that we really do produce food for, you know, for, for the world. And so just to reinforce what uh, uh, Rebecca said, um, it is there are multiple reasons why the U.S. has been so instrumental. One side note of this, the, chi the word China had been mentioned before. You know, China is the largest purchaser of U.S. agriculture commodities. By far and away, they're the lar largest purchaser. How complicated the whole international scene is. Just think about what you're seeing now in the news and everything else. China desperately needs our food products. Now, they can buy them from other places as well. But how do we leverage that in a way that tries to modify Chinese behavior? in the same time without necessarily moving down the road of trying to starve them either. It just, food is a real complicated political issue, geopolitical issue, and I'm glad that we're having this conference and I'm glad the subject's being raised so dramatically. So then I think that both you and Rebecca have made a, a persuasive um, case uh, for the United States being at the forefront in terms of addressing global, um, global food security. Yet, domestically, one question that is often raised is why should the U.S. taxpayers spend billions in overseas aid when the needs are so great at home? And then conversely, and I think, Baron, you addressed some of this, one question often raised in um, food aid recipient countries is why not support local food production rather than relying on imported food? So Dan, do you want to kick off? And we can uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> okay. 1% uh, of the bu budget of the United States, 1% goes to all foreign aid, all foreign assistance. When people are polled on this issue, they said, how much do you spend on foreign aid? People say 20%, 30%. It's 1%, and food aid is just a tiny part of that 1%. I mean, USAID provides development assistance and educational assistance, so it's a really tiny part of what America spends. And second of all, we should be proud of the fact that domestically, while we still have income inequality and food insecurity in America, we have the most developed, significant, and largest food assistance program in the world. And not just the SNAP program, but the women, infant, children program, our school meals programs. I mean, nobody is even close. Even the countries in Western Europe that have well-developed social welfare systems in the food area, they're way behind us. So that, that's a, a good thing, and we can do both. We're a rich country, and, but it does take people like yourselves advocating for this in order to let political leaders know that it's important for them to know that they, you know, they can do both. Um, and I look forward to the discussion about the Low Country Food Bank because I think we'll talk about that. Second issue, of course, is um, the local purchases. So historically, agriculture has tried to do their best to ensure that surplus food products, commodities, are donated overseas. And that's been the bulk of our agriculture commodities. And, um, but more and more people think that uh, we ought to be encouraging people to produce and develop their own commodities at home and cash payments as opposed to just commodity payments are a better way to go. And that's, that's been politically difficult in the United States because farm organizations and agriculturalists say, why are we doing this if we're not exporting our surplus food? But, but I, I do think there is a role for both cash, helping people develop their own agriculture systems, and especially in emergencies, 
humanitarian assistance, which is largely going to be commodities. I'll pick up there and come back to the first part later. So we need every tool in our toolbox to address global global hunger. Um, it, this problem is growing. It is going to grow as the population grows and as climate shocks continue. So we have to have both. Historically, US food assistance was entirely commodities. We would send corn and wheat and rice around the world. And what we found over time was that if you send corn into a community where they grow a lot of corn, it has a double negative impact um, because you then end up, end up undercutting, anybody who understands economics, you undercut the market, you drive down prices for the local farmers and then they end up needing assistance. So the US has become really sophisticated in thinking through where they send commodities and where they send cash. And, um, and WFP is really amazing that they can adapt and also provide information to the US government on what to send where. So if there is a functioning market, like Baron mentioned earlier, Absolutely, cash makes sense. That's supporting local merchants, local growers. WFP does have some programs that do help smallholder farmers increase their yields, have better uh, post-harvest loss results, uh, you know, not grow grain and then have it rot or be infested with, with insects. But there are places where there are not functioning markets. Yemen is the extreme example. Um, but then last year also with um, the Ukraine crisis, we needed US commodities to get to East Africa, full stop. Um, and there's a really amazing program. It's called the Bill Emerson Humanitarian Trust. And this is sort of the break glass in case of emergency. Unfortunately, we've needed to use it a couple times in the last decade. But it's a fund that's intended to buy US commodities and send them places. And um, thankfully, with the support from a bipartisan group of Congress, uh, USAID and USDA used that opportunity last year and sent over $300 million worth of US commodities to East Africa because their pipeline from Ukraine had been cut off. Um, but the US government, as far as where they're funding programs, and then WFP, as far as how they're implementing programs, are really thoughtful. There is a school of thought that looks at the efficiency of a US dollar that's sent as a cash-based transfer as opposed to sent as a US commodity, because there's a shipping cost. You, know, it, you can't just magically conjure you know, a bushel of wheat from Kansas and put it in Ethiopia. The challenge is, and Dan and I know this pretty well, is um, yes, it's academically, it makes a ton of sense. But one, if there isn't food, how are you going to get it? And secondly, the po political constituency that supports those commodity-based programs, well, that money's going to disappear if it doesn't tie back to US farmers, just to be really blunt about it. So it's needed, first of all. They're very thoughtful about not using it in a way that's detrimental to the local communities. And then uh, you know, it keeps an additional pot of money available for these really critical global needs. On the domestic side, I agree with Dan. It's an and. Um, my mentor and good friend, Tony Hall, talks about when he got, he was a member of Congress from Dayton, Ohio. And he got really interested in global hunger issues back in the 80s. And he went home to Dayton and they said, wait, we're hungry here. And so he really led an effort to bring the community together and look at the needs and address them together. And I know that's some of what's going on here and in communities around the country, and also with the tremendous support from US programs and US taxpayers. So I think it's important to talk about them together, realizing it looks different, the solutions are different, but nobody should worry about how they feed themselves and their family, whether it's in the United States or in Afghanistan. Great. Uh, so I'm a, we're going to take probably or just pose the last question and then kind of open it up to um, folks. So the issue of food security and addressing the vast inequalities of access to food globally seem massive and at times overwhelming because I'll get students at the end of class who are like, well, what can we do? Um, so what can one person or any group of people do to make a difference? Absolutely. Uh, talking about it. Talking about it. I think this, you know, Baron, you mentioned earlier, talking about it around the dinner table. You read the headlines, but then share what you're seeing. I think one of the reasons why there was such tremendous U.S. public support for addressing the Ethiopia famine in 83, 84 was because there were only three channels through which you saw the news. It was ABC, NBC, CBS, and it was like vanilla, French vanilla, and vanilla light. You know, it was kind of the same thing, just to press... Yeah. Chocolate. I don't know, you're being generous about the diversity there, Dan. But it was, it, you know, there, there, there was 
a very limited funnel through which folks were learning about le world events. Now, there are probably a thousand new channels a day. And so it does make it harder to get messages to you know, everybody in a consistent way about what the need is. So take it as your individual responsibility to pay attention, you know, whatever news channel you prefer. Or of course, our website always has information about what's going on. Um, and share that with your with your friends, with your family. And then what do you do with it? I, obviously, you know, money is always needed, even though the United States government provided that much money last year. The total need for WFP last year was over two bi 20 billion dollars, and they only received about 15 billion dollars, meaning there were five billion dollars in needs that weren't met. That means that folks got half rations, um, and that that does not result in a good situation. I was in Kenya last year at the Kakuma refugee settlement, and they had been on 50% rations for quite some time, and they'd seen an increase in violence in the camp. They'd seen an increase in malnutrition, particularly among the young children. And with part of that $5 billion that came through, the Kenyan WFP program was able to increase those rations back up to 80% and immediately saw a drop in conflict. And we're starting, even just in a short period of time, to see a reduction in malnutrition. So even a little bit makes a huge difference. The other thing is add your voice. You, know, you mentioned Lindsey Graham, you know, Senator Scott, all of the politicians. They need to know that there's support back home for what they want to do already in Congress. Um, and so if you get the chance to write them a note, we have an advocacy program that you can participate in through World Food Program USA. Um, any chance you get to talk to an elected official about you care about feeding people around the world and in Charleston and South Carolina, let them know that because that's what really makes a difference. It, it only takes, what is it, Dan, 10 or 15 letters from constituents to get a member of the House of Representatives to pay attention to an issue. It's, it's, it's not this overwhelming hurdle that I think sometimes it's perceived to be, you know, the capital up on the hill and you can't, you can't penetrate the fortress, but it, it doesn't take much. You just need to be intentional about it um, and persistent about it. You know, ask the questions at the town forums. So use your voice and if you're able to, use your wallet. Just reinforcing it, because I was a congressman for 18 years. Gresham is here, I think, somewhere. He's gonna be, he, he can have the personal experience. He represented South Carolina for eight years. Lobby your congressman, your congressional staff they're the ones that put the billion do billions of dollars in these programs. You lobby them by going to town hall meetings, by confronting them kindly, nicely. But uh, it's tough sometimes, I understand that. But, but uh, recognize that, particularly on a, vo a, a, a voice like this, it makes a huge difference. So go to the town hall meetings and make sure you don't neglect congressional staff, and not just members of Congress either. Uh, local officials and governors at, at, at all levels can make a big difference. You asked the question about food waste, for example. Well, there's a federal law called the Federal Good Samaritan Act, named after Bill Emerson. It, it provides immunization from liability for donating foods to the hungry. A lot of people don't take advantage of it, and there are local laws. I don't know if South Carolina has a law, but what I'm saying is the impact on lobbying your elected official makes a huge difference. The second thing is careers in development are really important. So every, I don't know if, if any of you, have anybody here been in the Peace Corps by any chance? Okay. So the Peace Corps is a remarkable place. It, it may have had more impact in years past, but I think it's rebuilding its impact as time goes on. And there are development careers where you can go and not only have a personal experience in helping people do better, feed themselves, get an education, and, and move on to a better place in society, but then they become the mouthpiece for these issues, as this gentleman down there who asked the question, uh, beforehand uh, uh, represented. So, so careers and, and global issues are really important to, to spread the word so that people know how important these issues are. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll open it up for questions if anybody wants to come to the mic and pose some questions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cynthia Thompson. I'm really interested in the coordination with the other NGOs. Um, some get a lot more publicity. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, you have organizations targeted at the same thing, hunger, uh, instability. What's the coordination with that, that your organization has with the other NGOs? So just by way of background, because this is important, 
The United States government does not designate specific funds through legislation to the United Nations World Food Program. Every dollar that the UN World Food Program gets from the United States government is through a competitive process on grants provided by USAID and to a lesser degree USDA. So what I love is that in the advocacy space, we come together with all of those NGOs, World Vision, Catholic Relief Service, Islamic Relief USA, um, Save the Children, Care, I can keep going. And we are all advocating for the same thing to Congress for those pots of money. What we want to do, there are three main accounts that provide global food assistance from the US government. And we work together to make those pots of money as big as possible. Um, that $5 billion last year, we led the campaign, but they all came alongside. We all were making the same asks of our network. Then we fight it out in the grants process on who gets what slices of the pie. But what's also interesting is that when the programs are implemented in the field, Many of those NGOs that I mentioned are partners on UNWFP programs. I'll, when I was in Kenya, I saw World Vision everywhere. Um, but what I learned recently is that in some places, the UN World Food Program is a sub to one of those other NGOs. And so they work really well together on sort of who's bringing the best tools to the situation. Um, I think USAID is very thoughtful about how they talk to the NGO partners and the UN World Food Program on how funds and resources are allocated. There are some places, in fact, many places, where the UN World Food Program can work that those other ones can't, um, just being under that UN banner that was mentioned earlier. And so um, I think that's an important piece too. But it really is about doing the most to help the most people around the world and who's best positioned to do that, um, not sort of breaking out in fisticuffs over who gets what pot of money. Hi, I'm Susanna Hoffman. I'm a medical student at the Medical University of South Carolina. And I had a question, um, thinking about the relationship of the meat industry with food security and nutrition through the effects of factory farming on the climate and environment and um, links between meat consumption and uh, heart disease and cancer and also the role factory farming plays in the spread of viruses like the avian flu, which could likely lead to the next um, pandemic. I was just wondering if you could talk about what role you might see plant-based eating um, playing in the fight against food insecurity and also any efforts you know of or are involved in in um, promoting that shift. It's not a very difficult political quagmire to get into. <laughs> um, but let me, let me we, we've talked before, Suzanne and I talked a little bit before. So I, wanna, I just want to get on my high horse, lobbying horse, for one second. The issue of food, health, and medicine is a neglected issue. Oftentimes, even in the humanitarian world, we focus on volume of food. Let's get more quantity in there. And if you're starving to death, you need that. But another issue has to do with medicine and health. And this is both domestically and globally. Our federal feeding programs largely have not focused on what goes into your mouth. It has more focused on how much goes into your mouth. And so we're needing to get that. So hopefully in your medical education, you'll give that some attention. Very few physicians are trained in prevention of disease. They're trained in treating you horizontally when you're pretty close to the end. Or, you know, many are better than that. But I'm just, I'm just saying that, that that is a big issue. So, you know, I, I don't want, you know, I'm one of these people that believes that most foods in moderation are, are okay. And, and I, so I don't want to get into saying that meat is bad or meat is good or plant-based is good as plant-based is bad. You know, we found, for example, that plant-based food is generally higher in sodium than, than traditional meat products are. Okay, so if you're hypertensive, that's not a necessarily a good thing to do. The facts are sometimes not easy to glean when you're talking about some of these issues because they're, they're very controversial. And obviously, this is, requires a need for more research on what we what's good for us, what we can eat, and, and those kinds of things. But, uh, but this is a growing issue in the global, the global food systems issue, is not only the volume of food that goes in your mouth, but what is it that goes into your mouth, and how you can pe keep people healthy in the process. And it's just something that I think we need to be thinking about. I'm glad there's a med student here who's 
uh, talking at these things. I know I went in for my physical, my doctor had Jolly Rancher candies as, as I was paying my bill. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know if my blood sugar was high, whether that's the kind of the good thing to do. But it's, it's something that obviously we need to pay more attention to. And, uh, and I think the food industry is understanding that. Why? Because the public is demanding it now. They never, they never really had this on the top of their heads before, and now they do. So let's just take one last question, yeah. and then we'll wrap it up. Um, I have one for each of you, if that's OK. But um, so for Rebecca first, I wondered if you could speak a little bit on decisions like, for example, the one mentioned about uh, Yemen and Ukraine, where you'll take aid away from one country to give more aid to another. What's the reasoning behind that? Do you want to ask Dan's too? And then we'll take uh, I'll just let you go first. Okay. Um, <laughs> I actually don't have an answer on that. That's something, that's one of those hard questions that I'm actually really grateful I'm not the person that has to make that decision. Um, Executive Director Beasley talked last year about how he was having, and his team were having to make decisions to take from the hungry to give to the starving. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the calculation. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you, but if you give me your information, I'll be glad to find one for you. And Gresham Barrett from the World Food Program yeah. might have an answer in his comments, too. I, I would just add this point. We are facing a real serious debt problem. You know, we have a potential uh, default facing us this summer on debt. I don't think we'll default. God forbid if that happens. But what it's, what it's going to do is to put some real fiscal binds on us in terms of spending across the board. And, you know, I can see certainly how some people will look at the international affairs account and decide, oh, that's easy to cut. If we have to choose between it and, let's say, Medicare, let's choose the international affairs budget. And the fact of the matter is we're a rich enough country to be able to do all the above. And it's important that your voices be heard in terms of protecting those that international affairs uh, global affairs budget as we look at the more macro big issues involving American spending. All right, um, and then my next question was, could you speak a little bit on the impact of U.S. sanctions, such as in against Russia in the recent uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, how that impacts global and local hunger? I'm not 100% familiar with the sanctions because so many of the sanctions have been imposed on banks and oligarchs. And, um, you know, Max would probably be a better expert than me to talk about the impact of these sanctions. Um, I know that uh, there are some fee people who feel that they have had mixed impact because the Russians have been able to take advantage of their oil supplies and the increasing prices to actually get resources in that were higher than anticipated before. But I, you know, we don't have any choice but to, to try to penalize the Russians for their behavior in the best, in the most targeted way that we possibly can. So uh, to date, I don't think that the sanctions themselves have had an impact on um, food prices or food supplies uh, in the, uh, especially in the developing world. And, and I'll just add on that real quickly. In, in some instances, not every, but the, um, food and medicine are exempted from the sanctions as well, just for yeah. the, the reasons that Dan mentioned. Okay, folks, thank you so much um, to both Dan and Rebecca.